Sponsored by Surfshark. Why are ground and neutral wires separated in subpanels? When do we need a subpanel? When do we need a grounding electrode? And how are the panels connected? Let's find out. The electrical panel is where all of our circuits get their power from. Each circuit has a circuit breaker. If we run out of space for a new breaker, then we need a sub panel. Or we can install one in another room where lots of circuits exist. That's much easier to install than running multiple wires. Additionally, we can use a sub panel to provide power to an external structure. The sub panel is basically just an extension of the main panel. So grab a pen and paper to make some notes and sip from your engineering mindset mug. Let's understand how the system works. Remember, electricity is dangerous and can be fatal. You must be qualified and competent to carry out any electrical work. You should also check with a local inspector to ensure compliance with regulations. Electricity is generated at the power station and then transmitted at high voltages over long distances to substations. Here, the voltage is reduced and the power is then distributed locally on power poles. A pole-mounted transformer connects to this and reduces the voltage to a safer level for residential use. Notice the power is distributed using three different phases. But our pole-mounted transformer typically just connects to only one of these phases for residential properties. We then find three wires, or service conductors, running from the transformer to the property. These are two hot wires, or ungrounded conductors, and a neutral or a grounded neutral conductor. This part is known as the service drop. They enter the property through a weather head or a service head. From here, they run down to the electrical meter. Inside the meter box, the neutral passes straight through, but the two hot wires are separated by a gap. The electricity meter slots into this gap, providing a path across it. And from here, it can then measure the current flowing through the hot wires to your property. You are then billed for this consumption of energy. Removing the meter while current is flowing can cause arcing, which is very dangerous. From the meter, we have three different typical scenarios. One, the wires run to the main panel mounted externally. Two, they run to an internal main panel. And three, they run to an external disconnect and then to the main panel. The disconnect could also be built into the meter box. In the first two scenarios, inside the main panel, we first find a main breaker, which looks something like this. We can see there are two lug terminals on top. The two hot wires, or service conductors, will connect into these. Coming out of the main breaker are two separate hot bus bars, and that's these oddly shaped metal plates. Each hot wire connects to just one of these bus bars through the main breaker. In this case, it is our main disconnect, allowing us to energize or de-energize the entire home. With scenario three, our main disconnect is outside. We may or may not find another breaker in the main panel. The main breaker is a double pole breaker. So both hot wires are connected or disconnected at the same time. We can manually flip this on or off, but it will automatically trip if we exceed the current rating printed on the latch. This provides our main overcurrent protection. Notice this one is just two 100 amp breakers tied together. That does not quite give us 200 amps though. Sure, you could provide 100 amps on each bus bar and have 200 amps combined, but if just one of the bus bars uses over 100 amps, both breakers will trip together. The panel will provide power to different circuits for lighting, receptacles, air conditioning, etc. These are branch circuits. Each branch circuit has a circuit breaker, which looks something like this. These simply hook into the casing and then slot onto the protruding metal plates of the bus bars we can place them on either side. Notice that if I use the top slot on either side, it would connect to hot bus bar one, whereas slot two connects to hot bus bar two. We then run a hot wire or ungrounded conductor to power the load, for example, a light fitting. The white neutral wire 
or branch circuit grounded conductor then connects from the fittings and goes back to the neutral ground bus bar, which looks something like this. Our service neutral or grounded conductor then connects to this bus bar. We also find the ground wire or equipment grounding conductor running back to the main panel and connecting to all metal parts in that branch. The circuit is now complete, so we can control the light using the switch. If we measure between either hot bus bar and the neutral, we will read 120 volts. But if we measure across both hot bus bars, then we read 240 volts. We typically have a bus bar on either side of the panel. On one of the bus bars, we find a thick copper wire running down to a grounding electrode. This wire is therefore the grounding electrode conductor. The two bus bars are then joined in the main panel if the service disconnect is located in there. So these become neutral ground bus bars. We also find this green screw on the neutral bus bar. This is the main bonding jumper, which connects the neutral to the metal casing. We will see why that's important later on in this video. However, Scenario 3 is different. The service hot wires connect to the main breaker. Then they connect to the hot bus bar lugs in the main panel. There may or may not be an additional disconnect here. From the circuit breaker, the hot wire goes to the load, but the neutral comes back to a separate neutral bus bar which is not bonded to the metal case. The ground wire also comes back to a separate bus bar. These travel back to the main disconnect box and both connect to the same bus bar. This is where we find the main bonding jumper. The service neutral connects to this bus bar also. And we also find a connection going down to the grounding electrode. The current flows through the main breaker, through the main panel hot bus bars, and then through the light fitting. It then travels back on the neutral to the dedicated neutral bus bar and then back to the bus bar in the service disconnect. The ground and the neutral do not connect in the main panel. Same as with a sub-panel, which we'll look at in just a moment. Now, this electrical system is different from other parts of the world, but oddly, so is Netflix. This is the US version, and this is the UK version. Even YouTube blocks videos based on your location. Luckily, our sponsor Surfshark VPN solves this problem. Just choose the location you want to appear in, click connect, and your device virtually appears there. And so the content is unlocked. Major news sites are completely different based on your device's location. Even Home Depot blocks you unless you virtually change your location. And you basically just connect to their server, it gives you a local IP address, and then they encrypt the connection. That's it. They have an app and a browser extension, which is super easy to use. Personally, whenever I connect to a public Wi-Fi, I always use a VPN to keep my browsing and personal information protected. Their clean web feature also blocks ads, trackers, malware, phishing attempts, etc. And you can try it now by clicking the link in the description and using code ENGINEERINGMINDSET for three months extra for free. Do check them out, links down below. For the sub-panel, this will either be mounted next to the main panel, in an additional room, or in an external structure. In each case, we use a double pole breaker, which looks something like this. This slots into the main panel and connects to both hot bus bars. This should be compatible and approved by the main panel manufacturer. From the breaker, we have our two hot wires and these run to the sub-panel and connect into the lugs of the two hot bus bars. Notice the sub-panel typically doesn't have a main breaker. It just has these lug connections. So this is a main lug panel board. The power disconnect and overcurrent protection is controlled through the double pole circuit breaker in the main panel in this example. We then have our neutral conductor running from the neutral ground bus bar and this connects to a dedicated neutral bus bar in the sub-panel. This is not bonded to the metal casing. Then we have our equipment grounding conductor running from the neutral ground bus bar 
and over to a dedicated ground bus bar. This group of four wires traveling over to the subpanel are known as the feeder. Where the subpanel will be installed in a separate building or structure, we need to install a grounding electrode, and we connect it to the equipment grounding conductor terminal bus bar. However, if the panel is installed in the same property, then we do not need an additional grounding electrode. Now we can attach a circuit breaker to the panel and provide power to our loads. The neutral will come back and connect to the dedicated neutral terminal bus bar. The ground wire will connect to the dedicated ground bus bar, otherwise known as the equipment grounding conductor terminal bus bar. This is bonded to the metal enclosure. The neutral and the ground wires must always be separated in the sub panel, but they can be connected in the main panel if the main disconnect is located there. If the main disconnect is external, then they are separated in the main panel. So let's find out what the reason is for that. Under normal conditions, the current will flow in from the service connection, through the main breaker, down the hot bus bar, and out of the circuit breaker. It then travels on the feeder, over to the sub panel, down the sub panel hot bus bar, out of the sub panel circuit breaker, to the load, then back to the sub panel neutral bus bar, then to the ground neutral bus bar of the main panel, and then back to the transformer. Notice the ground wire isn't used at all. However, under a normal ground fault condition, where the hot wire touches the metal casing, the current will flow from the breaker across the metal casing, back along the ground wire to the sub panel, then back to the main panel, and from here it can get to the neutral to complete the circuit. Because there is almost no resistance in this route, this will cause a huge and instantaneous surge in current. This would cause the breaker to trip and cut the circuit. That is why we must bond the neutral and the ground together at the main disconnect. This provides a complete circuit so that the breaker can trip under a fault condition. If the main bonding jumper was removed, so we had no connection between ground and neutral in the system, then when a ground fault occurs, where will the current flow? Well, there's no connection, so all the metal parts become electrified we might get some current flowing through the grounding electrode, maybe something like 4 or 10 amps, for example. But if the breaker is rated for 20 amps, then it will not trip. However, if we accidentally bonded the ground and neutral in the sub-panel, and we also bonded it in the main disconnect, what will happen? Well, the ground fault current would flow along the ground wire back to the main panel, and out the transformer. But it will also flow in parallel back through the neutral from the sub panel and to the main panel and then to the transformer. If there was a metal raceway between the panels, the current will flow on this also. Or if you touched both panels, it will flow through you as you now also provide a path. So we definitely don't want this occurring. We just want the fault current to flow on one wire, which is the ground wire, back to the main panel. If for some reason the neutral became disconnected on the sub panel, while it's incorrectly bonded, then all the return current will flow on the ground wire back to the main panel. We do not want that. If we remove the incorrect bonding, then the current can't flow as there is no complete path now. So now we know that there is a problem in the circuit. However, if we correctly bonded just the main disconnect and then we lost the service neutral, what will happen? Well, the rest of the circuit is fine, but we have a path from the neutral ground bus bar through the grounding electrode back to the transformer. And so we might have some current flowing here. As the case is bonded to the ground and neutral, it too becomes electrified we would read a lower voltage because the load resistance and the ground path resistance are now effectively a series circuit. And as you might know, voltage divides between resistors in series. Additionally, if we have correctly bonded our system, 
but then we have a ground fault occur, while the service neutral is disconnected, then the ground fault current will flow to the neutral ground busbar, but its only path is to the grounding electrode. Attached to this is the metal casing though, and as there is no resistance at the point of the fault, the panel casing and all the metal surfaces become 120 volts. There is a very large resistance in the path between the two grounding electrodes, so some current might flow here, but it might not be enough to trip the breaker. To trip the breaker, we need a GFCI, or a ground fault circuit interrupter. This monitors the current flowing out of the hot and back onto the neutral, and if these two currents are not equal, then the current must have found an alternative route so the breaker trips to cut the power. Don't forget to check out Surfshark, click the link and use code ENGINEERINGMINDSET for 3 months extra for free. Check out one of the videos on screen now to continue learning about electrical engineering and I'll catch you there for the next lesson. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, TikTok, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, etc. We also have the website, theengineeringmindset.com.